Can you hear me now? Okay. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, so, have you uh, or your employees ever needed important instruction while performing uh, an important maintenance task? Or perhaps, uh, have you ever wondered what a piece of art uh, meaning was while staring at a statue or whatever? Well, I, I did for many reasons, not just because of my job, as you will see, but because we, as human, human beings, uh, interact with uh, reality always, continuously. And asking questions about reality is what we you, human beings do. So today, I would like to talk about uh, how augmented reality can help to uh, make our lives better from this point of view. And to this regard, we also talk about specifically about object tracking, so the most advanced uh, um, achievement from this point of view. And finally, I will um, mm, okay, sorry, talk about some important use cases uh, that make um, uh, uh, our um, that help us to describe our augmented reality effectively can help us. So depending on your background, your job, or your interests, you may know or not what augmented reality is. Um, so basically, I would like, first of all, to define augmented reality. Because if you look for augmented reality on the web, this is what you will look for, you will find. And actually, this definition is not 100% complete. And indeed, it is just 33% complete, if you want. But it, a more uh, complete definition of augmented reality has been given from, by Ronald Azuma in a survey on augmented reality. And basically, it says almost the same thing as the previous definition. But uh, uh, a little lines later in his survey, he adds that uh, an augmented reality system actually has three major components. The first one, the requirements that augmented reality systems must combine the real and the virtual, and this is the same thing that we have seen uh, so far, but also it must be interacting in real time. This meaning that all the action for the end user must happen in real time, not like it happens, for example, uh, with visual effects uh, like we see in movies. And most importantly, importantly, another characteristic of the augmented reality system is that it must be registered in 3D. This meaning that an object that you display using a smartphone or a smart glass must be strictly attac attached to the reality. So if you move, the object stays in place, and not doesn't float or somewhere, or it's just fixed on your uh, point of view. Uh, so, uh, if, um, for the sake of completeness, we also can talk about a um, mixed reality, because lately this is a, so, um, uh, something that is coming out more frequently. And the mixed reality um, actually is a wider concept than augmented reality. Uh, if you look at this uh, um, scheme, uh, you see that augmented reality is just a part of mixed reality. Mixed reality actually uh, entails everything that comes from the real, the reality and overall and to virtual environments, so virtual reality, but does not include uh, both virtual reality and the real world. Uh, and so basically, augmented reality is just a specific case of mixed reality. But look at this picture. We, have, uh, we are all used with this kind of blockbusters and movies and visual effects. This may look like augmented reality because we see the T-Rex exactly there, and we have con very we think that the, that uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex is there. But actually, what is missing? Why it is this is not augmented reality? This is not augmented reality because it's not interactive. It's missing the in one important thing: the interactivity in real time. And. Uh, Specifically, to create this kind of image, you will need very, very um, power computers, uh, specifically render farms. And so, just to create one single image for uh, this kind of um, visual effects, you will need a lot of time. Uh, whereas, uh, when talking about augmented reality, usually you have to create real-time computer graphics, and you have to do it uh, 
eventually on smartphones or eventually on other devices that have very little computational powers, like smart glasses. Um, so the requirements are very different, especially if you think that what happens uh, with the augmented reality is that the hardware and the software must, in, in a way, understand the reality. Uh, and also, it must be done continuously um, for 30 or 60 times for each image. Uh, fortunately enough, the hardware evolution helped us a lot from this point of view, because starting from five or four years ago, uh, the performances of CPUs also on mobile devices improved a lot. So we managed to have very interesting things also on mobile devices. Um, just sum up the differences among these kind of technologies. So we say that augmented reality uh, has these characteristics, and what makes it different from mixed reality system is the fact that uh, in augmented reality system are registered in 3D, so the objects are, are exactly there, whereas mixed reality system are more relaxed from this point of view. Whereas regarding the um, mixed uh, visual effect system, what is missing is the interactivity in real time. Um, as I told you, what is really, uh, what happens behind the scene for augmented reality system is uh, an understanding of the reality, and this must happen continuously. And this is a very, very strong requirement for augmented reality system. Um, and one may think that basically the understanding of reality could be just Mm, some algorithm that look at an image and try to find out what's happening. But actually, in order to achieve real-time performances, we must rely on at least a two kind of mm, processes. Uh, first, a recognition, understanding where an object is, and eventually also uh, understand how the camera is positioned with respect to uh, that object. But uh, to have uh, um, real-time performances, we have also an important task that is usually called tracking. So basically, we try to find some important features in a smart way and not on, in, on all the image, for instance. And this allows us to mm, run at 30, 60 frames per second, for instance. Um, basically, to do this kind of thing, so to understand the reality, we rely on sensors. Then either... Uh, common sensors or camera, anyway, are also sensors by themselves. And using camera-based methods, you can track and recognize markers, as we will see, or images like posters, blueprints, or the environment itself, uh, or objects. And this is what we will mm, focus uh, in a while. Um, but you also can rely on sensors. For instance, if you want to track the user position on, on Earth, uh, or uh, you can use, oh, sorry, I just skipped away. Uh, here it is, sorry. Uh, I was saying locations or the inertial measure units, so yeah, basically the orientation of the you know, device in space, uh, or also mechanical um, sensors that allows you to have very accurate uh, positioning of a device, or electromagnetic and acoustical um, methods. Um, this is an example, for instance, of a marker-based tracking. And the problem with this approach is that uh, they are actually the, the one of the advantages that are very, very fast. And it's one of the first techniques that was used um, in the early days of augmented reality. Uh, also, uh, you can understand that there is something, and so they are very noticeable, and you can understand uh, that something will happen if you look at this kind of things. Um, but um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, they have some problems. For instance, they are very ugly. And if you want to um, make a marketing campaign, for instance, for a good-looking object like a car or um, something else, it's not very good to use these kind of objects. Uh, and uh, another problem is, uh, is that they are very sensitive to lighting changes. So if they have shadows on top of them, they will stop working. Or if you try, uh, if you cover an edge of the black square, it, it won't work anymore. Um, but 
another problem, so, so is they are noticeable because they are very uh, ice striking and they, so it doesn't make sense to use them uh, um, everywhere. Another approach that is usually better is based on images. And in this way, you can track and recognize features on genetic images, so posters, and blueprints, and the likes. Uh, so they're usually nice to use, and, and the user won't complain about it. Um, they are also fast, so they can be used uh, on uh, mobile devices as well. Uh, and they are less sensitive to light changes with respect to the previous technology. Uh, and they also have quite tolerant um, behavior with respect to occlusion, so you can cover the page, for instance, of a newspaper. And you don't notice that there is something special with this kind of images. So this is actually also um, um, a problem because you have to tell the user that there must be something happening on that page, so you have to uh, use also stickers to say, to trigger the augmented reality, actually. And also another important kind of a method to understand reality is based on uh, um, what is called simultaneous location and mapping. It's a SLAM approach, actually. And it allows you to uh, scan the environment you are in and to create a map of the environment. Um, actually, this kind of approach um, is uh, quite fast, so it's usually usable also on the mobile devices. Uh, and they, and also occlusion, so you can also move uh, in the vi envir environment and uh, not affecting tracking too, too much. Um, you don't know that something is in that environment, so there is, must be some uh, mechanism to uh, tell the user that something happened there, but this is not really a problem, actually. And one problem is that you have to make some specific movements to start tracking and recognizing the environment. And it's called usually a slam dance, technically. And if lightning change in the environment, the map that you have created may not work anymore. Um, also, a uh, problem with this approach is that if you use it just as is, you won't have any information about the size of the environment that you are scanning, so you have uh, to add other information. And you cannot recognize a specific place or an object in this way. It's very difficult. Um, Another mm, tracking method that we have mentioned is location-based tracking. Um, but basically, this method is uh, um, it's still very fast. It relies on uh, the GPS and the uh, IEMU unit on your devices, so the compass and uh, gyros and so on. Um, and also, it does not have, mm, have any problem with light changes because it relies not on vision, computer vision, but just on um, sensor installed on your device. And it works very well with um, objects in the distance, not an object really near to you, really close to you, because of the errors of uh, sensors. So you know that you use GPS, the position can change, uh, and this is not very accurate. You could have five meters errors. So it doesn't work with close distances, but just long distances. But it drains your battery, and uh, actually, although this should be in the other list, you can manage occlusion because you are not using um, computer vision. So you can also pass through uh, in front of an object, and you will see the, um, the object uh, in augmented reality as well. Um, usually, for this kind of things, uh, they are used with balloons like this to highlight some spots, but done, this method doesn't work very well if you want to, uh, for instance, uh, display some object in front of this, that church and have this object stick to the, uh, the church itself, because you see that sometimes uh, the content moves and floats uh, in the air. Yeah, this jittering problem. Uh, also, the sensors are usually very uh, noise dependent, so if you have electromagnetic fields in nearby, the GPS won't work very well, or the compass and things like this. Uh, one of the most important achievements in, in computer vision tracking is uh, object-based object tracking, and this is what uh, I'm going to describe better. Um, the um, good thing about uh, uh, this approach is that you it works in real-world scenarios, uh, so this make, <coughs> makes um, this method employable in real-world scenarios. 
it somehow it does not, uh, uh, it's not affected a lot by lightning changes, as we will see, and it can end also occlusion of the object itself. Uh, the problem is that you don't know if an object is, um, be, can be recognized or not. You have to add some information to it, or you must know it in advance. Uh, and uh, also, lighting changes, it's also a problem, because depending on the technique, uh, it could be affect, the track mechanism could be, could be affected by lighting changes as well. And some methods, especially the most recent one, are quite slow, not really performant, but with um, um, advances in uh, hardware and techniques, uh, these problems are going to disappear in a few months, maybe. <clears throat> and so with the latest uh, improvement and the latest devices, um, these are not really the problems anymore. Um, so one question is how we can make AR. We have seen what AR is and some of the methods that can be used for augmented reality, uh, but <laughs> you have several kind of possibilities to create augmented reality experience. You can rely on uh, authoring tools, basically can be in form of um, plugins for content creation software, or platforms, uh, general purpose platform or vertical pl platforms uh, for the industry, for instance, or for cultural heritage. Uh, you can choose many for them. And these kind of tools are mostly um, designed for content creators, so not programmers and the likes. Or if you are a software developer, you can rely on a, a, um, software development kits. In this case, you need programming skills, uh, eventually computer vision skills, um, and all, everything that is related to um, software development in general. Or you can use a mix of the above approaches. Uh, for instance, you can rely on um, softwares like uh, Unity 3D that can be used either by content creators or by uh, programmers. Uh, and so this is a more hybrid approach if you want. Or finally, you can just ask someone else to create the argumentary experience for you. So uh, for instance, you have uh, an industry or a factory and you want someone mm, to create an application for maintenance and you can just ask someone else to do it. And this is just uh, something that can cost you some money. Um, so for instance, this is an example of uh, a plugin approach. Uh, basically, in this case, we are using a 3ds Max. <clears throat> and we have a plugin for 3ds Max. 3ds Max is a content creation software for 3D um, of any kind. So it's quite easy because you um, load or create your 3D model. And this is a classic view of 3ds Max. And then you have installed the plugin. And with just one click, <clears throat> you can see the same 3D model in augmented reality, like we see now. And this is very easy from the user end point of view because you just use tools you are used to and you are not to learn anything else. And this works just in real time as we have seen right now. Or if you want to, you are a developer, you can use SDK, I would say, and this is just a matter of writing code, code, and code. Um, but <clears throat> it makes sense depending on your business. And the other approach I mentioned was a hybrid approach where, for instance, if you're using, uh, you're using Unity, you import the uh, uh, tracking core and a package inside Unity. Uh, you use, import the trackable data uh, that represent the object that you want to track. And you set up your scene, the content, and then finally you configure the player settings and deploy the application or mobile devices or whatever. And um, these are typical um, screenshot of uh, one Unity plugin. Uh, you see all the steps, uh, you add the targets that you want to track, and you can add the content on top of that. Make some <coughs> configuration steps, and that's it. Nothing else. So um, now I want to go to the core of the, uh, of the subject. And we have talked about the definition of augmented reality, how you can make augmented reality. Um, and among all the methods that we have talked about, uh, uh, there are some that still make sense. For instance, the image-based um, tracking method it still makes sense. Uh, sometimes the marker-based method also. But uh, in uh, some scenarios, for instance, uh, in the industry, if you want to um, provide instruction for machineries in, in a factory, 
you could have thousands of machines. Or uh, if you think about a museum, uh, maybe the museum itself won't allow to, to add the markers or images or stickers on top of a piece of art, of course. Uh, object tracking is very useful in this kind of uh, scenarios, as we'll see. Um, basically, there are two main approaches to object tracking. Uh, feature maps or feature-based approach and model-based or <coughs> edge-based approach. Um, on the left, you see a typical feature maps approach where um, features from the object surfaces are uh, extracted and are used to represent the object itself, uh, while on the other side, you see a typical model-based approach. And basically, it works uh, uh, by finding edges uh, important edges of the object. Uh, simply stated, uh, with features-based uh, approach, uh, you um, search the surface of the, uh, of the object you want to recognize and track, but uh, using the edge-based approach, you recognize the shapes, more or less. This is uh, uh, the feature map approach in action. Uh, here you will see the features that were extracted from this car, uh, and they are tracked in real time. Um, also, using this approach that is quite um, fast, uh, you can not only recognize one object per time, but you can also eventually use more trackables and more objects um, at the same time. For instance, uh, with the same application here, we were tracking both the exterior of the car, but also the dashboard like you see in this case. Previously, we were just looking at the features. Now we are looking at a real application where you can tap each um, spot and get information about how the functionality that is highlighted. <coughs> Here you see the object um, tracking methods, that is the edge-based tracking. In this case, you have, for instance, a wireframe of the car and you have to uh, align your camera and the wireframe to the real object. And when the alignment is uh, done, you can start moving and track the object. So uh, in order to compare this, um, these methods, uh, let's consider the phases that one has to pass through in order to create augmented reality uh, experiences in general. Uh, the phases are this one, and specifically, uh, the trackable, uh, trackable authoring phase is where you define the object that you want to track and also uh, where you um, define the coordinate system where all the contents will be placed with respect to the uh, tracked object. Uh, the mm, content authoring phase is where you add the actual content on top of the tracked object. And these phases uh, overall are usually um, done by a team of people that could be developers or content creators, uh, something that is using a, an authoring platform. And uh, um, together are usually called uh, just authoring for uh, simplicity. Uh, the final phase, uh, the experience execution uh, phase, is where you deploy your application and the trackable data uh, to mobile devices and another person uh, different from the one that created the application experience the augmented reality content. And this may be different, but in, uh, in the initial stages of the development, uh, it could be the same person that were just trying to uh, tune the uh, tracking engine and trackable data. So, uh, so if, let, could, let's go to each phase. Uh, talking about the trackable authoring phase, uh, let's focus first on feature maps. Uh, approach. Here you usually take several pictures from many angles of the object that you want to recognize and track. And from those pictures, uh, you create, uh, using a sp um, specific software or platforms, uh, a point cloud of that object. So a 3D representation of the features of that object. And also, uh, as you can see on the blue squares, um, the method allows you to create, the, uh, to reconstruct the position of each uh, photographs when you, that you took to create that point cloud. And this is important because the, during the um, uh, execution of the experience, the user somehow must be near those position in order to start tracking the object. Uh, whereas the model-based uh, approach uh, requires you to provide a CAD model of the object that you may have or may not. And 
from that CAD model, you highlight uh, um, boundaries or sh the shape that you want to actually recognize and also provide uh, the right angle to be, um, that will be the starting position for tracking. So basically, when a user will use your uh, augmented reality experience, he should try to align this uh, um, shape to the real object, and then he can move uh, around. But um, with the feature maps approach, actually, you must uh, do some uh, steps, uh, specifically using the pictures that you have taken for, of the object and a reference 3D model, you may, must make some correspondences from 3D points and 2D points in order to uh, choose the same uh, um, coordinate system of the 3D model. And this, as we will see next, allows you to uh, place the content correctly uh, with the respect to the 3D model. And then when you, you will use the experience, you will see the content exactly in that position, but with respect to the real object. Whereas the model-based method actually doesn't require any other step. Uh, talk about the content altering, uh, you will basically use um, a content creation software or uh, any platform that allows you to create the reference model that you have used, either the CAD model or the point cloud that you have reconstructed. And uh, uh, using the, mm, your content creation software, you just place the content all around this reference model. In this way, when the uh, augmented reality experience will be played uh, on a mobile devices, you will see that content exactly in, in the position that you have um, specified using these tools. You can also add not only 3D models, but also uh, movies or uh, create interaction among the objects and, and the likes. Mm, this is actually a representation that comes from um, the reconstruction of a um, model car and using the model, uh, the feature map approach. And this model is very noisy because it was reconstructed using the point cloud and the object itself is very reflective, so it's quite bad, but just for uh, demonstration purposes. Whereas uh, for the CAD model base, you just have an accurate CAD model, so everything is, looks much um, better from this point of view. Um, so let's compare a little bit the bot methods. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, first, uh, uh, there is another step. The third phase is when the user must uh, use your augmented reality experience. Let's pretend that he needs to track this car. And using the feature map approach, uh, the user needs to uh, um, put his uh, device in a way that resembles one of the images that were used to create the, the point cloud and uh, tracking data itself. So if the user managed to be close to any of those point of views, he will manage to start tracking the car. Otherwise, he, he will not. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the model-based tracking method, uh, what happens is that the user must uh, align the, 3D shapes that has been used during the previous phases to start tracking. That's how it, the initialization phase works. And um, I, I want to compare these um, methods under some respects. Um, for instance, the steps used, um, required to create the trackable data for both methods are very different. For a model-based method, you just need one step. Basically, you just create the load the CAD model and choose the point of view. Uh, for the um, um, feature map, map methods, actually, you have to do a lot of work. Uh, take pictures, uh, create the point cloud, uh, align the model, so it requires a lot of work, actually. Uh, but the starting points for tracking uh, using the uh, feature map methods are many more. So you actually could start tracking an object all around the object itself, while uh, using the model-based approach, uh, you just have one point of view to start tracking. And initialization time, uh, it's uh, actually quite high, usually, for the feature map approach, because you, you can, it's true that you can start tracking from many points of view, uh, but this kind of search uh, of the right uh, position can require some time, uh, whereas the model-based approach, once you know the, the position that you have to have, it's very, it's very quick to, to start. 
also other important factors that uh, can um, affect the user experience and the quality of a, a method uh, are the one that we are going to look now. Uh, for instance, uh, the feature maps uh, method is uh, affected quite a lot uh, from lighting changes because it depends on how you took pictures of the object. So the, if light is different from those pictures, you may have problems. Whereas the model-based approach is not really affected from this point of view because it just recognizes the shapes as long as there is a minimum light in the ambient, uh, in the environment. Um, the appearance, uh, this meaning, um, the appearance of the surface, it could be textured or not, it could be dirt uh, or, or worn. And of course, the feature map methods uh, is affected a lot from this point of view because it really depends on the appearance of the surface and, and not the boundaries as the model-based approach. And the environment that is surrounding the object uh, for the feature map approach uh, can be actually removed from pictures, so you can say that it is not uh, affecting it very much. And using the model-based approach, since we are focusing only on the boundaries of the object, again, doesn't affect the tracking uh, a lot from this point of view. Uh, reflection and opacity of the objects uh, can be a really problem for feature maps approach because uh, if you move, you will see the reflection on the surface of the object moving around, so tracking will be very bad. Uh, whereas this doesn't happen with the model-based approach because the uh, reflection are uh, not uh, present on the boundaries, on edges. And finally, um, sorry, not finally, uh, the, um, there's another one, uh, usability. This meaning that um, how easy to use these methods. Um, talking about um, developers and content creators' point of view, uh, we have seen that uh, creating trackable data for feature maps requires a lot of steps, uh, whereas for model-based tracking requires just one or a couple of steps, so it's much more easier. Uh, but uh, talking about a user and point of view, the feature maps methods are usually it's easier because you, you can start recognizing and tracking an object from many different points of view. Whereas uh, for the model-based methods, you have just one point of view to start from. This is the reason for these colors and designs. And finally, the generalization uh, parameters uh, is related to the fact that you can recognize not only one specific object, but many objects that are identical to, to that one. For instance, uh, uh, you can think about um, the component of machinery and so on. And problem is that mm, model-based approach can be, um, it's very good from this point of view because it does not take in consideration, for instance, all the dirt that can be on the surface. So every object that has, that has the same shape works great uh, with that object. Whereas the feature map approach, if you have taken pictures of an object, maybe on an identical object, but with different scratches and so on, it will not work. I want to go a little fast on this. It doesn't add many things. Basically, you can mix uh, the initialization and the tracking phases, but I want to talk a little bit about some use cases uh, I've been working on. And these use cases have been enabling uh, in um, real-world settings thanks mainly to the efficiency of the latest computer uh, object tracking methods, um, also the availability of vertical platform for creating the augmented reality experience either in the industrial sectors, sectors or in cultural heritage, for instance, and also thanks to the availability of mobile and wearable devices. Uh, the first one is uh, a project that we have been doing lately with uh, Huawei. Actually, since more or less two years, we are doing some uh, experimentation with them. And you know, with this company that does not always create mobile devices, but also inverters and uh, solar um, you know, photovoltaic systems, we have created a system for maintenance and training uh, to carry on important, important tasks on this kind of equipment. Uh, so here you will see instruction about steps that you can do on the real object itself. Then I go fast on this. Okay, this is another case, I want to skip it. Uh, this is another company uh, that creates a mechanical component. And again, here we just highlighted some information on machinery for 
visitors of the factory themselves. And also another um, nice was, uh, uh, use case that is related to ABB. And again, we provided destruction and augmented reality for maintenance of uh, specific equipment. But I just want to go ahead because the time is over. Um, okay, just this. Sorry about this, I want to skip it. Okay, this is a nice use case in the cultural heritage uh, field. Uh, here in Rome, we use augmented reality to provide uh, instruction like this to users. So basically, you have a Samsung Gear uh, device, uh, use it um, with the pass through technology. So, not use it for uh, VR, but for augmented reality. And you can see how it, the, uh, the Arab Arches monument was uh, in the original times. That's it. And if you go in Rome, it is uh, available. In uh, okay, I think it's this is the last one in the automotive industry. One nice thing about this use case that not only we were using mobile devices like tab tablets and um, smartphone, but also the apps on Moverio smart glasses. And we created an interface with um, onboarding system, so we get real-time information about the engine and consumption and the likes, and we see them on the smart glasses display. So that's it. Uh, I hope that I've shed some light on object tracking and how they can help uh, in real world scenarios. Um, if you have any questions, please, you're welcome. Thank you, Alessandro. Thanks.